seen for a while back in the church today. And uh, your sister, you didn't know it, I, I guess you knew it, but uh, your sister used to go with my cousin, <laughs> Russell Williams. <laughs> and, uh, well, I don't want to get into that, but we've got things to do. <laughs> you know, I, I'm so glad the pastor allowed me to come today to speak. Uh, the, uh, you know, at the height of, of real trust is when a pastor will let another pastor speak in his pulpit and not be there. <laughs> but I think uh, your pastor knows that I won't do him any harm. At least if I can't do him any good, I'll try not to harm him. <laughs> he and Nita are doing better. And God is good, isn't he? So we expect a full recovery there, and, and we'll see their faces back in around here again. You know, one of the things that I never could figure out, I haven't preached here in a long time. Well, I've left myself open, because preaching is sort of a critique thing, you know, and so when I say I haven't preached here, uh, you can get a lot of people who agree with me, and I'm glad you didn't give it to me. <laughs> I've preached here in a long time. And so they have all this paraphernalia that they wear up here now. Uh, you know, when I was preaching, I just yelled. And uh, so what they do, they take tape. I'm just giving you a little insight because uh, you may want to know this. And uh, they take tape and tape it down to your face. And uh, it draws your mouth over here like this. <laughs> and so I may not get it all out unless the tape comes through. <laughs> good to see you today. Amen. And God is great, isn't he? Amen. God is good. And uh, let us thank him uh, for all these things. Our lesson today is Matthew chapter 11 verses 1 through 6, and we're looking at John the Baptist, who had a peculiar problem, and that is that he was in jail. Uh, it seems like he told on the king, who came over and stole another king's wife and married her, and he said, that's not lawful. And so all of a sudden, John the Baptist was in a prison, <laughs> looking out through the bar. And uh, so we're looking at John the Baptist, and he has some questions. Let's listen to what they are. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, that is Christ, through the disciples, are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? Because if you're the expected one, you know, we've got some problems over here in this jailhouse, and we know that you're the Messiah, you have the power to get us out. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and what you see. Um, you know, I think that's always a good test. If you're troubled about something, go to the Lord and see what he's doing. Join him where he's working. Um, so here is what John said, uh, heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at him. So we may not know for sure in looking at this passage whether John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus for his sake or for the disciples' sake, or maybe both. Uh, John seems to be groping for some answers out of the tough circumstances that he's in. He's in prison, nobody's speaking to him, nobody's coming to him, uh, and his teachers 
certainly looks pretty dim at this point. So here are some answers out of some very tough circumstances. And, uh, and so let's look at some truths that begin to flow out of this circumstance. You know, first of all, from our prison house of circumstances, we may have our faith tested. That's the number one point. I know it's not good to hear, but look at verses 2 and 3. Now, when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? So, from our prison house of circumstances, and trouble and trials and tribulations, our faith may be tested even there. Amen. Even though we have baptized the Messiah and have been separated from him and don't know who he is or what is happening, we may be tested. Your blood pressure may be up and your bank account may be down. Maybe you've lost a loved one and a shroud of melancholy hangs over your soul. You know, dungeons bring depression. And from depression, it's easy to move to doubt. We remember the bumper sticker, Honk if you love Jesus. Remember that one? I saw one once that said, Honk if you love anything. Uh, so here's John in prison begging for some kind of relief and an answer to his problem. And I want to tell you that often our faith staggers because of our expectations. Christians do grow broke. They get canceled. They lose their jobs. Our problem is that often Jesus offers no ex exemptions and many times no explanation. Lord, what is going on? Is that you? Is that somebody else? And nothing seemed to be coming back. Uh, so I want to say that the only thing he offered John centered right in his integrity and his character and his sovereignty. He sent word, word back and said, this is what's happening where Jesus is. He is healing people. He's raising people and doing these kinds of things. That's what I'm offering you for an answer, uh, John. Our Lord is still on the throne. He's still doing his work. And so that's where you need to center your faith and trust in him. Uh, I think Habakkuk uh, had great problems uh, with God at times. And I love the book of, of Habakkuk. Uh, and in chapter 1 of this book, here is Habakkuk having some real problems with life. And the oracle, chapter 1, verse 1, the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? You ever been there? Why aren't you saying anything, Lord? You know, I have worked for you. I've been faithful to you. I have done all these things. And now, Lord, you can see the mess that we're in, the trouble that is so painful. Lord, you're not saying anything. So here are the problems that Habakkuk had with God at times. And his response in chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter two, verse 1, says this. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. Habakkuk said, I'm going to give it a time test. I'm going to wait and see. And I think sometimes that, that, that's the thing that we need, that God, rather than sitting on my horn, racing my engine, crying out for help, let's just wait and see what you're up to and what you're going to do. You know, God, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. So Habakkuk said, well, I'm having this problem. God is not speaking, but I'll wait until the, all the evidence is in. That takes faith, doesn't it? <laughs> wait until the evidence is in. Oh, we're having tough times right now. Wait till the evidence is in. 
Give it some time. So his, his faith is expressed in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what he said. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the, the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should cut, be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet. You remember that? Word about hind feet in the Bible. What were hind feet? Mountain goats. You know, that walked around in all these craggy places because they had sure feet. And uh, because they could do that, the enemy could not get them and eat them. Uh, and so there they were on the cliffs. But he says, My feet will be like hind feet. And makes me to walk on my high places. Um, listen. We can have faith in the Lord this morning, can't we? Amen. Uh, though the stock market may crash, and uh, though the oil price dries up, and uh, though the banks fail, and they have all these things. Uh, though the worst of my fears is realized through all of these things, listen to what Habakkuk says. I will trust the Lord. That's where my faith will rest with the Lord. And friend, you can trust the Lord the same today too. I don't know what you're going through. I've got a good idea about what some of you are going through. But listen, friend. Wait till all the Wait till God gets through the program. Wait till God has taken you through everything that he intends to take you through. Wait on him because he has a, a plan for you. He says, I know the way I want to go. I know the way uh, that I plan to send you. And so <clears throat> I will trust the Lord. You know, I read a book by Corey Tim Boone. Uh, you remember her, The Hiding Place? And uh, Corey was having some problems with her, the matter of death. And uh, she went to a funeral and saw a little baby die. And she grasped her hand. It was cold and still. And it, it bothered Carrie Tim Boone. Uh, and so, after a while, her father came up to the room, having not seen her. And he sat down on her bed because she was there. And Corey said, I burst into tears. I need you. I saw, I saw. You can't die. He's talking to her father. You can't die. Don't die. I need you. Uh, and uh, her father sat down on the narrow edge of the bed and said, Corey, when you go to Amsterdam, Madame, when do I give you the ticket? He often took her with him on business trips. And she sniffed a few times and uh, she said, why, just before we get on the train. Exactly. And our wise Heavenly Father knows when we're going to have needs to don't run ahead of it. When the time comes that some of us will have to die, Corey, you will look into your heart and you will find the strength you need just in time of your crisis. That's the way God works. He always gives us strength just in time. Ever notice that? God shoves us maybe to the edge here, maybe to the edge there, and we're going to fall. It's going to be a disaster. But I want to tell you that Jesus is always in charge of the agenda. Amen. Now, look at, uh, look at verses 2 and 3 again. And uh, 
you'll find out what he's saying. I can't find it anyhow. Uh, Jesus is always in charge of the evidence. No yes, no, no answer. That's what he did to Thomas. He said, I'm not going to give you an answer. Until Thomas finally could stick his hands into his side and his hands and, and that kind of thing. You see, the point is that what Jesus will ultimately do is give you the information and let you decide. Amen. It's hard work to be a Christian. <laughs> God is going to trust you with some information and uh, let you take it and run with it. Uh, and that's what he was doing to John in the prison. And that's what he does to you and me many times. He just gives us information and lets us decide. But what Jesus was saying to John in prison was, look, uh, I'm running on schedule. It may not be as you expected, but don't be upset about it. Because I'm on schedule. And it's a lot more important that I be on schedule than to have you always questioning what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. So Jesus admonished of us in verse 6 when he said, do not be disappointed in him. Don't be disappointed in, in him. Uh, isn't it interesting that we always want to try to bend Christ to our expectations? Uh, that's why Jesus, I think, put real life over rule. And that's why he went to the outcast rather than the elite. And that's why he preached love and grace rather than law and justice. So here's Christ's sovereignty. Don't be disappointed in us. His sovereignty may cause many to stumble this morning. You know what his sovereignty means? His sovereignty means that God does what he pleases when he pleases. And he doesn't ask you. That's his sovereignty. Amen. And you know, his sovereignty may cause some to stumble this morning. I, I have to admit to you in my weakness that I have done a lot of stumbling this week in past week, in three weeks. And, uh, you know, don't look so pious and self-righteous. We've all done it, haven't we? Amen. We've stumbled around a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> we gave our time and now trouble hits. And we can't understand it. We prayed the prayer of faith, Lord, heal. And God didn't come through. Our loved one was taken, and the ungodly up the street are still alive. What's going on, Lord? Well, you know, faith is the way we deal with the sovereignty of God. That's the way. My daughter left last week to go back to. Uh, Cincinnati. I'm going to bring that in just a little bit and I'll quit. But uh, there was a time when she had a dread cancer uh, that looked like it may, take, may have taken her life. Uh, and uh, what do we do? I mean, have you ever been pressed right up against the death of a loved one? And you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing was happening and nobody was speaking. Church was praying, I was crying. What do you do? Because it looks like God and his sovereignty is going to take her. And I don't know if I can handle that. So while everybody was praying and while I was grumbling, oh my daughter. <laughs> I read a piece in Norman Vincent Peale. I normally don't read those things, but I happen to have one in my office somewhere. So I picked that thing up and flipped through it. And he was talking about healing. Norman Vincent Peale. And one of the things he said that caught my attention immediately was, you know, we can't pray for healing 
for healing's sake. Just to go on our way and forget about it. Thanks, Lord, you've healed us now. Let's forget about it. We've got things to do. We can't pray for healing for healing's sake. But we've got to pray for healing that the greater glory of God may be manifested in the healing. And I got Tina in the office with me. I was in Bakersfield that time. And I said, Tina, read this. And she read it. And I said, do you agree to this? And she said, I do. And from that moment on, she and I began to pray that the healing, if it came, would manifest the greater glory of God. Well, do you know how that goes when we wait for cancer treatment. You know, it seems like when you get cancer, the doctors want to leave town or uh, have some other things to do. And we want to say, get with it, get with it. You know, we've got a problem here. And so we couldn't get the doctor right. And finally, we chose to go to UCLA and uh, took her down there, took all of the information. And uh, so while we were there, the doctor said, well, I have to tell you that information is no good. Just keep it or throw it away. Because here in this building, in this office, um, we, do not, uh, we do not trust anybody else's uh, tests. And uh, so, okay. Because in Bakersfield, the test said when it came back that she was at level three and a half. You know, level four is where you don't want it. To me, level three and a half is where I didn't want it. Said level three and a half. So my prayer was, God, I don't know what's going on. I need help. Can't you just back that thing up a little bit so that we can handle it? That was my prayer. Back it up, God. Back it up. And you know, when we got down there with all the tests and they did their own biopsy and brought the reports back, uh, the report showed that the cancer was one millimeter more shallow than the report in the maker's field One millimeter. You say, big deal, what is that? About? Well, with cancer, a millimeter is a mile. And they were only told us that God had heard our prayer and backed it up so that the cancer would be handled. Tina went in, got an operation. Doctor said it wasn't very bad. We just took it out, no problem. What about the follow-up? No, no follow-up. What about chemotherapy? No chemotherapy. Uh, she ought to be as good as she ever was. And so for 20 years now, she has, she's as good as she ever was. <laughs> because God heard our prayer at that time. So faith is the way that we deal with the sovereignty of God, faith. You know, the Lord didn't save Daniel from the lion's den, but he saved him, saved him in it. God didn't round David around the valley of the shadow of death. He just led him right through it. And uh, so faith is necessary when the circumstances are not clear, when we don't know what the answer is, and we're, when we're crying out for help. Faith is the answer. Let me give you some terrific thoughts for troubled people. <clears throat> what can you do when the bottom drops out? Well, in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, eight and nine uh, there is a word. Listen to what he says. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says God, nor are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than that's what God says to us in our circumstances. Uh, my, high, my, my, uh, my work 
is going to go on. My sovereignty will prevail. Trust me on the outcome. That's what God has been saying to us. So when that time comes, trust God's thoughts. He's thinking about you. I want to tell you this. He's thinking about you. He knows what you're going through. He's on, you're on his mind constantly. Trust his thoughts. Trust what he's going to do. Trust the way he's going to lead you. You know, Martin Luther used to climb the Scala Santa, the sacred stairs, on his knees at noon. And he was praying to God and that kind of thing. Um, and, and finally he wrote his thesis about God and uh, uh, and so the, the result was that um, I've only forgotten one thing since I've been up here. Isn't that great? Yeah. That ought to be an applause. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get back there too, you know. I am. <laughs> Anyhow. Martin Luther was the guy who nailed the 95 pieces on the door of Wittenberg and said, here I take my stand. Men are justified by faith. That's the truth of it. Men are justified by faith. And so Martin Luther took that stand and 200 years later, uh, in a little Moravian chapel, the preface to that piece that Martin Luther did was being read in that little chapel. Not many people were there. But there was one particular little boy or man that was there, and he responded to the justification by faith introduction that Martin Luther had written. You know who it was? John Wesley. 